This module focuses on the physical therapy examination for individuals with MS. When going through this module, it's important for you to continue to think back to this slide and consider the setting in which you're working. The principles outlined in the subsequent slides try to capture the essence of the examination across the spectrum of care. Identifying the information that's most pertinent to you in your work environment will allow you to cater your exam in a timely and direct manner. Another thing to consider is where your patient is in the disease process. Early in the disease process, the focus can be more on restorative and preventative interventions because people in the beginning stages of the disease are more functional and have better capacity for return of function. Later in the disease process, compensatory interventions, as well as prevention of secondary conditions and disuse and maintenance of physical function, should be optimized to promote well-being. The ICF model is commonly used with physical therapists, and it aims to incorporate a global perspective of an individual during an examination to better identify all the factors that impact their ability to function. The subjective component of the exam focuses on the health condition and related information, as well as personal and environmental factors that contribute to physical limitations. The objective components of the exam should include tests to identify body impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions. As an example, let's see how the ICF model works for an individual with MS. The pathogenesis of MS causes inflammation and neurodegeneration, which leads to axonal damage and neuronal loss. Body functions can be affected by these changes, causing fatigue, depression, poor endurance, muscle weakness, and sensory changes. All of these impairments cause the activity of walking to be difficult, which decreases quality of life, independence with ADLs, recreational activities, and decreases work capacity. However, physical activity and positive lifestyle can be a contextual factor that helps to decrease inflammation, delay axonal damage, prevent impairments from affecting gait, and preserving quality of life and an individual's ability to participate in their environment. When it comes to managing the needs of people living with MS, a multidisciplinary healthcare team is essential. Each person on the care team provides expertise regarding disease and symptom management for particular areas. Collaborating with other members of the MS care team and always remembering to include the patient and the caregiver helps patients get the best care possible with individualized attention to address the most important needs based on each person's disease course. Discussing the subjective exam, I'm only going to focus on the key aspects of examination for people with MS. Another side will be included in this presentation that lists other subjective information that should be included in a general neurological PT evaluation. Specifically for people with MS, understanding the medical and surgical history is very important. Since MS can affect so many body systems, identifying essential components of the medical history can greatly impact your understanding of the patient. Depression, cognitive impairment, Cardiovascular history and bowel and bladder problems can all affect PT intervention and should be addressed prior to treatment. Surgical history can include information about spasticity management, such as intrathecal baclofen or Botox. The MS diagnostic history allows you to identify if a patient is still in the relapsing remitting phase of MS, to understand how frequently relapses have been occurring, and if there's been a minor or severe functional decline and to help you get a feel for the individual's unique presentation of MS since the disease is so variable. Prior level of function is similar to the diagnostic history with a little more emphasis on physical activity. Identifying what a patient was able to do before they had a relapse or a few months prior, if they have progressive MS, helps to set realistic goals and provide appropriate challenge with interventions. Exercise programs are also important because exercise provides many benefits for people with MS. Knowing their commitment to exercise helps us understand their compliance, determination to be healthy, and identify lack of knowledge for us to educate them. Personality and motivation is important because MS requires lifelong management. Does their personality encourage this? What motivation do they have, and how have they or are they coping with their diagnosis of MS? This question also cues us to provide them with resources for support groups, MS education, financial planning, or mental health. 
Caregiver and family support is essential for planning the progressive changes that occur with MS. By determining how much assistance is available and the family support and resources that an individual has allows you to individualize your intervention for the patient's specific circumstances. The home environment, especially accessibility, helps physical therapists determine appropriate equipment to use with patients with MS and allows PTs to develop strategies to help MS patients perform important activities based on their home layout and design. Asking patients with MS if they are heat sensitive is important because hot temperatures or increased body temperatures can increase fatigue, exacerbate symptoms, and decrease functional abilities. Understanding the impact heat has on their function cues you to use cooling strategies during treatment to prevent excess fatigue. Finally, let's take a closer look at medications on the next slide. MS medications are constantly changing, but there are currently injection, oral, and infusion medications that are the first-line disease-modifying therapies to help treat MS. Disease-modifying therapies do not cure MS or reverse the pathology of the disease, but they have been shown to decrease the number of relapses that occur and slow down the functional disability in people with MS. Betaserone, Copaxone, and Rebif are the injection medications. One of the main problems with these medications is compliance, since Avonex, Betaserone, and Rebif cause flu-like symptoms, and Copaxone causes redness and lumps at the injection site. Jelenia and Abagio are the oral medications currently approved, but BG12 is another oral medication that should be out on the market soon. Though compliance is easier with oral medications, there are still potentially serious side effects, such as a slow heart rate after the first dose or macular edema with Jelenia. The infusion medications include Tisabri and Avantrone, given one time a month, but again these come with potentially serious side effects. PML, a rare but usually fatal brain disease, can occur with Tisabri, especially if an individual has a positive JC virus. Novantrone has been approved for individuals with secondary progressive MS, but can cause side effects such as heart and liver damage or leukemia. IV steroids are often given after an acute relapse, but chronic steroid use typically has more disadvantages than advantages for individuals with MS. A number of symptom management medications also exist to help prevent disability and maintain health. Please pause the video now if you would like to look at other components of the subjective examination that can be considered with people with MS. In terms of impairment and body function limitations, spasticity is often present in people with MS and should be tested. Though the modified Ashworth scale does not have great psychometric data, it is still often used clinically to grossly identify if and to what extent spasticity is present. Passive range of motion can aid in a clinician's understanding of how spasticity impacts movement in an individual. Spasticity is often present in knee extensors, knee flexors, ankle plantar flexors, and hip adductors, but may be present elsewhere. Visual and vestibular dysfunction can occur with MS and affect balance and gait. Testing visual acuity and ocular motility helps identify visual limitations such as diplopia or residual deficits from optic neuritis. VOR and nystagmus can determine if central vestibular dysfunction is present and impacting function. Muscle strength is often decreased in people with MS. Primary muscle weakness can occur because of nerve damage to the central nervous system, and secondary muscle weakness can occur because of disuse and deconditioning. Assessing muscle strength using manual muscle testing and functional positions helps guide appropriate intervention strategies. Fatigue is also one of the most common symptoms in individuals with MS, and it can affect their endurance, cognition, and overall function. Using the visual analog scale from 0 to 10 can help quantify fatigue. The MFIS is an outcome measure that can also be used to assess fatigue. More information on this measure can be found in the Resources on Outcome Measures on the module website. The cerebellum can be affected in individuals with MS, so coordination tests such as finger-nose-finger, heel-to-shin, and alternating movements help to identify tremor, ataxia, dysmetria, and dystiatocokinesis. Sensory testing to identify proprioception, localization, and vibration impairments 
assists in understanding limitations to balance. Individuals with MS might have impaired vibration before other sensory problems are noticed. And dual task abilities are often more challenging for people with MS. Dual task walking should be assessed in patients who can perform walking tests in the clinic but complain of falls and poor balance at home. Please pause the video now if you would like to look at other components of the objective test that examine impairment and body function limitations in people with MS. Regarding activity measures, using tests to identify balance and falls risk are essential since falls are more likely for people with MS and can lead to serious functional deterioration. Transfer training will likely change over time and patients will need to learn new strategies as their disease progresses to stay safe and maximize independence during transfers. And finally, gait is impaired even in patients with very early MS, an EDSS of 1 to 3, and it should be measured, especially since it will often be a primary goal of your patients. Other activity level measures to consider in your examination are included on this slide. Finally, participation measures translate the impairments found during your objective tests and measures into snapshots of an individual's life and where they feel they are the most restricted. Focus on participation for people with MS should include the areas of home management, quality of life, and role function. Individuals with walking and mobility problems often have decreased quality of life due to social and financial burden. So challenging patients with MS to identify what they contribute to their family, home, and social lives, and what is important for them helps find meaning in their lives and stays motivated during PT intervention. There are certain medical conditions that PTs should be aware of when working with people with MS. UTIs can increase spasticity, and aspiration pneumonia or pulmonary dysfunction can affect endurance. Skin breakdown is more likely in people with advanced MS who have very limited mobility. Osteoporosis can increase risk of fractures and untreated depression can slow or prevent recovery. Identifying these complications that may require referral to a doctor helps us effectively manage our patients with MS. The following are specific goals to consider when working with patients with MS in order to optimize care and manage their needs. This concludes the MS evaluation module. Please complete the evaluation post-test and continue to explore information that interests you in the remaining modules.